for joining us and for being a part of World Affairs 2013. I'm Jane Wales. I'm CEO of the World Affairs Council, and I'm sorry I'm so loud. Let me get used to this here. Um, I want to especially welcome the 48 uh, students and uh, faculty members from high schools and colleges around, uh, around the Bay Area who are joining us. Thanks so much for being a part of this. I also want to in, uh, invite you all to welcome our new um, our new fellows who are post 9-11 veterans uh, who are joining us as well. So thank you very much for being part of this conversation. Um, while you're surrounded by very interesting folks here in the room, let me just note that the uh, the entire conference, or at least the plenary sessions of the conference, are going to be are being streamed uh, live, and so we're being joined by folks from around uh, the country and around the world. And we urge both you and those joining us by uh, by the web to take advantage of the opportunity to use Twitter to ask your questions or to make your comments um, and uh, and be part of the conversation. Our Twitter. Uh, handle is world is at world underscore affairs and the conference hashtag is WA2013. Now I'd like to just say a word or two about the context within which we're we're meeting today. Um, we're coming off the elections in this country. We've been in the middle of a debate in Congress about how to pay our bills or not. Um, we are, uh, we're seeing um, that governance is actually very hard, even if you're a country that has had its political system in place for over 200 years. I think most Americans agree that governance takes us all. It's the shared management of, or the management of shared problems. Um, and the, uh, the stewarding, the stewardship of, of shared resources. And that, that takes every one of us, that, that you know, government can't take care of it all, that the private sector can't manage it all. Even the most inventive uh, nonprofit organizations, civic organizations and the philanthropies that, that support them, they can't do it all. It, it takes us all. Um, but, but the agreement may end there. Because um, what we see is that the social contract, which is the way in which we allocate responsibility and resources for the management of shared problems, that social contract is contested. Um, it's in flux. Uh, that's true here. Uh, that's true all over the world. And so we're starting, we're going to devote a good part of today and tomorrow to taking a look at these transitions, these transitions that are either the result of a contested social contract or, are, or may be leading to a contested social contract. And we'll start, of course, with Tahrir Square. Um, Tahrir Square happened two years ago. It's over two years ago that the January 25 uh, events happened that led to the toppling of Mubarak, uh, the bringing in of President Morsi, um, the pretty much into the military having uh, such a strong role uh, in governance. But that transition that had all of our attentions is far from over, uh, very far from over. And I suspect that Fareed Zakaria, who will be wrapping up our conversation tomorrow afternoon, would say that that has everything to do with the sequencing of events. That is to say, the fact that they moved forward with elections prior to having established the democratic constitutions of governance. Um, that is to say, political parties, uh, a constitution, uh, an establishment of the rights and responsibilities of various citizens. That wasn't yet in place. Um, the elections preceded. And he would argue that it is that sequencing that has made this transition particularly difficult. However, I should note that he'll probably say um, that with every, every democratic advance, there is usually a reaction, uh, a, a, a response uh, before you move on to, to a clearer path. I'd just like to note that there is one other society in the region that chose that sequencing of events, and that society was Iraq. 
So we will have uh, a great opportunity today and tomorrow to talk to experts in the region, uh, experts in governance, experts in human rights, uh, and a variety of other cross-cutting issues such as the economy, uh, to get a sense of you know, whether Farid is right or may maybe it's a more complicated set of realities. Um, we will not only focus on political transitions, but economic transitions. And of course, here the big story that we all know is the extraordinary uh, economic growth in emerging economies. Enviable to us, this level of growth that you see in Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, China, uh, India, um, and, and beyond. And here's a situation in which, uh, as I say, the growth is enviable, it's robust, it keeps going, uh, even with, with some setbacks. Um, but it's not broad-based. Uh, it's not felt by all. And development is, economic development is not inclusive. Um, and so that poses its own set of challenges. Um, greater growing economic disparities uh, in some societies that don't accept that at all, uh, that find that very, very worrisome. Uh, and at least one society in China where corruption, uh, political corruption, uh, or I should say corruption on the part of, of political leaders um, has torn away uh, at the trust uh, that um, really is the, the collateral on which any uh, social contract must rely. And so we'll hear from experts from each of these uh, parts of the world where we've seen such rapid change, such hopeful moments, but also some key issues that, um, that stand in the way of everyone benefiting from it. I've spoken to the political and economic transitions we'll look at, but perhaps the most consequential of the transitions is the gradual altering of the Earth's uh, physiology. Uh, climate change, environmental degradation, um, these are powerful uh, and consequential trends um, that will require ad our adaptation. We're very lucky um, to be joined by John Steinbrenner, an extraordinary scholar who led a study of climate change for the National Academy of Sciences. I guess you'd call climate change the ultimate disruption um, and I think we'll, we'll talk about a lot of other disruptions, such as Iran, uh, problems with uh, their going forward with their nuclear program, problems with North Korea that has been uh, kind of baffling uh, in its belligerence of late, uh, and of course the tragedy of Syria. These are all disruptions. But you know, we, we stand here, or we sit here in, uh, in San Francisco, and we're surrounded by lots of people from Washington uh, who see disruptions usually as negatives, as crises to be dealt with, or chronic problems uh, that we failed to address. Just south of us in Silicon Valley, uh, the word disruption is a positive word. It means taking systems that don't work, like the system of poverty uh, or climate change, and replacing them with systems that do work. Um, and we're going to be able to hear this afternoon from Chris Anderson, who will talk about such an effort through the maker movement that's uh, allows for manufacturing in very rich societies and very poor and remote societies, offering a new system within uh, economies. Um, but we'll also, uh, this evening, I hope you'll all take part in um, Innovating for Impact, which is a session with uh, nonprofit organizations and social enterprises that are finding solutions to really tough problems in ingenious ways. Um, you're going to find, I mean, we always encourage people who come to our annual conference to take advantage not only of the remarkable speakers that have traveled this far to share their expertise with us, but with the folks sitting around you, the people to your right and to your left. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary gathering of citizens uh, who are willing to sort of set, the, set aside any biases at the door and come in and look at, at tough problems together. What you'll notice is that all sectors are represented. Um, you might have next to you somebody who is a government official, somebody who comes out of private enterprise, uh, somebody who runs a nonprofit organization. And 
that's not by accident. Um, we're actually persuaded that whatever the social contract looks like as we go ahead, whatever the arrangement that we're considering uh, as we try to address a given problem, it'll probably be the result of a set of cross-sectoral activities. Um, you know, it'll be an arrangement or an alliance that takes advantage of the attributes of each. So let me just call your attention to those attributes because I think about them often when I think about the problems we face. Face. The public sector, you know, in a democracy, we get both the um, transparency and the accountability of democratic governance. Uh, when it comes to the private sector, the private sector offers efficiency, it offers scale. Uh, when it comes to the nonprofit sector, uh, civic, civil society, what we see is extraordinary agility and an ability to be responsive to conditions on the ground. Uh, and then finally, when it comes to the philanthropic sector, there's a high risk appetite that is lacking almost everywhere else um, and an ability to have, to take a long view. And those attributes, all of those attributes will be very much a part of the problem solving when it comes to the, the issues that we'll be addressing in the, the two days ahead. As I said, it, it takes us all. I'll just close by saying there are an awful lot of people um, of late that I've heard argue, and sometimes I'm one of those people, argue that we've become just so polarized as a country that we've relinquished, we've sort of forfeited our ability to solve large problems together. I'd like to challenge that and ask you to challenge that over the two days ahead. I think your presence here is a suggestion that that may well be wrong, that we still have that capacity to solve problems together. And I want to thank you uh, very much for, uh, for being here with that purpose in mind. Let me just end with a couple other thank yous. Um, I want to thank Carla Thorson and her team for pulling this all together and getting me to the podium on time to boot. Um, I want to thank our, our partners in this effort, that's Chevron, as well as Marines Memorial Association, so thank you to them. Finally, I really want to thank our speakers. Um, many of them come from Washington and New York, which means many of them braved snow, sleet, and hail uh, to join us, so a particular uh, expression of gratitude to them. Now, I get to introduce the first panel, and so the first of these uh, speakers. I don't get to introduce the speaker, I get to introduce the moderator. Um, his name is Mark Hertzgard. He is an author and journalist with, uh, who's been covering uh, climate change in great depth. Uh, he's a fellow at the New America Foundation. He's an environmental correspondent for the nation uh, and co-founder of a group called Climate Parents. So please join me in welcoming Mark. Thank you, Jane. I'm not trying to look like Marco Rubio here. <laughs> Hair's too long anyway. It is very nice to see so many young people out there. So, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the World Affairs Council of Northern California, I'd like to welcome you to San Francisco and to the opening keynote session on the strategic implications of climate change. We are delighted and honored to have with us today John Steinbrenner, Professor of Public Policy at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland and the Director of the Center for International Security and uh, of the director of the Center for International and Security Studies at University of Maryland. Now, doubtless many of you have noticed the dramatic increase recently in extreme weather events. Uh, in the United States alone, last year brought us Hurricane Sandy and the unforgettable devastation of our greatest city and surrounding region. It also brought the hottest summer in recorded history in the United States, the worst drought in 50 years, and by the way, that's a drought that is continuing throughout much of the farm belt in this country. You don't hear much about that in the media, but it's happening. We saw the same thing in Russia in 2010. Crops failed, led the government to, to restrict its exports, caused a panic in food markets around the world. 
floods in Pakistan that year left 14 million people homeless. 14 million in one of the most volatile nations on earth. These and many other events contribute to a growing sense of the world as more unstable or at least more unpredictable. And while congressional Republicans and Fox News still insist otherwise, the overwhelming scientific consensus is that the climate is changing and indeed that because of the lag effects of greenhouse gases, that the climate will continue to change for decades to come, even if we begin to reduce our annual emissions of greenhouse gases. So, what are the strategic implications of this? What are the threats that climate change poses to human societies, both now and in the future? Can anything be done to mitigate those threats or adapt to them? Those are the questions we're going to tackle this afternoon, and we have a distinguished ex expert to discuss them with us. Dr. John, St John Steinbrunner recently chaired the National Academy of Sciences study assessing the impact of climate change on social and political stress. He'll deliver his remarks, and then I will moderate a discussion between him and you. So get prepared with your questions. Uh, you can hand them in to people along the aisles. They'll bring them up to me and uh, we'll talk then. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you, please give in, join me in giving John Steinbrenner a very warm welcome to the World Affairs Council. Is this working? Can you turn that on? Let me say that um, I count a lot on the discussion. I'm at least as interested in hearing from you as you are in hearing from me. I'm, um, and, but I, I want to say some things to get, get us all started. Um, and and I, um, uh, the first two things I have to say is that uh, admit that the background for this or the basis for my coming and talking to you or daring to do it was uh, chairing this National Academy of Sciences study that included a number of the climate scientists uh, as, long, as well as social scientists who were um, eager to try to figure out what the social implications of this was. So I've been listening to them for a year and absorbing what they've been saying. However, I'm about to sort of give my own take, so you cannot blame them for about what I'm about to say. Uh, the, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council is innocent for from this, from this point on in this pr presentation. Uh, I, what I want to do is begin uh, uh, with a couple of statements about what it is that we know and what it is that we don't know. Um, and uh, uh, because you hear a lot about the uncertainty associated with this topic. Um, uh, and the scientists, of course, are very tender about what it is that they can say with scientific conviction. Uh, uh, the details, actually, of climate change are wonderfully complicated and very uncertain. Um, but the basics are very simple and very stark. There are some things we know as well as we know anything, and that um, we know the radiative forcing effect of the CO2 molecule. We know the atmospheric dwell time of that molecule more than a century. Uh, and we know where we've measured CO2 concentrations over time. Uh, and we know that, that the, the effects of these measurements uh, are going to give a very large thermal impulse um, to the Earth's ecology that will have to be balanced in some way. This is basic physics. There is no uncertainty whatsoever about it. Um, we, with somewhat less, only slightly less uncertainty, we also know that the rate at which we are adding CO2 to the atmosphere is 10 times greater than anything recorded in the last 400,000 years. And that time period is significant because that's the period of time over which we have fairly good annual estimates from ice core data. Uh, a lot of work went into creating that. Um, beyond that, it's a little, un, you know, it's not an annual estimate, but, but um, uh, uh, there is a, an, an argument uh, to the effect that 
the rate is actually a current rate is 20,000 times greater than the rate that drove uh, the Earth's uh, deep ocean temperatures to their maximum 55 million years ago. Now that occurred over millions of years, but we're going at a, at, at, uh, a much more rapid rate than that. Um, and this is just a, a picture, it's not big enough probably for you to see, uh, of the entire paleoclimate record. Um, and the top graph shows the thermal maximum. This is deep open, open temperatures were about uh, 10 degrees centigrade uh, more than they are now. And it's been a downward trend ever since. This part of that graph is broken out here, and this part is broken out here. Um, um, and uh, uh, if you take a look at it, um, there are some obvious historical reference points. Um, that are fairly sobering. Um, the current sea levels uh, that we now experience are four to six meters lower uh, than they were during the Emian period 130,000 years ago, where deep open temperatures were exactly the same as they currently are. Um, and if you go back to the Pliocene period, um, uh, that's several million years ago, um, uh, there was only a, the deep ocean temperatures were only a single degree centigrade higher than they currently are, and we're almost certainly going to hit that. Uh, sea levels were 25 meters higher than they currently are. Um, and what that means is um, that the ultimately necessary, inevitable energy balance adjustment associated with our thermal impulse is running late. Um, uh, Either sea level rises are going to be a lot more rapid than are currently being projected, um, or there's some, and possibly at a nonlinear rate. Um, let me just. Um, uh, uh, or um, uh, there is some other mechanism uh, of adjustment going on that we uh, have not yet determined, and there's a lot of speculation actually about a lot of the heat. Uh, going into the deep ocean and increasing the, the temperatures of the deep, deep ocean. So the bottom line of all this is the consequences of global change are, subs are certainly going to be very large. We know that without any degree of uncertainty whatsoever. But unfortunately, and here comes the human drama of this, um, the character, magnitude, timing, and location of those consequences cannot be predicted with sufficient confidence to really sort of tell us what to do about it um, um, in, or sort of say where the consequences would be. And just to give a little bit of indication of what's happening among the climate scientists, um, this shows um, uh, this part. These are the models of Arctic ice formation based upon historical data. Uh, and the black line here in the middle are, are the average projections. Um, you know, it begins in 1900 and, and, and brings up, so you, you calibrate the models based upon historic observations. And then you project based on what we think we know about ice dynamics. And the average of all the models here, and these are three sigma variations on both sides. Okay, but it turns out that the ice is disappearing much more rapidly than the models can take into account, i.e., we don't understand what's going on. Um, and it's happening more rapidly in that instance than we can um, take account for. Um, uh, in this situation, uh, uh, you can say that decisive mitigation, I, we could, in principle, halt the thermal impulse at about let's say 500 parts per million, that probably would preserve um, the operating conditions of human societies. We could, in principle, do that, but we're not remotely doing it at the moment. And you cannot project at the moment that that will happen um, because the effort, the energy transformation required has not yet been organized. Um, and we're nowhere near organizing it. Um, so therefore, we have to anticipate uh, extraordinarily severe burdens of adaptation incurring with increasing frequency and severity over the next several decades. Now, in the Academy report, we, we talk a lot about this in very general terms, point out it's, it's a complicated interaction between 
the vulnerability of populations, their coping ability, their reaction in their government, and the climate insult that actually produces the consequence, i.e. it's very, very complicated and you have to understand it down at local levels and mostly we don't understand anything down at local levels. Um, um, but in order to make that a little bit more concrete, I want to sort of take you through the Pakistan example. <clears throat> Uh, because there's a good reason to believe that actually Pakistan is the place on earth uh, that is most likely or is encountering, if you will, the most significant climate impulse at the moment. Um, I don't have to tell you that Pakistan is an internally fragile society. We all know that. Um, it has a very prominent agricultural sector. Um, the numbers there, 23% of their GDP, 40%, 4% of their labor force, 65% of their foreign exchange earnings. <clears throat> it is highly dependent upon hydrology in the Indus River watershed. Um, uh, Pakistan is a semi-arid uh, or predominantly arid territory, um, and 30 to 40% of the Indus River water flow derives from glacier and snow melt. Um, um, in this situation, um, uh, Pakistan faces very sharp trade-offs in water allocation between irrigation and power generation. Much of their power is based upon uh, thermoelectric uh, uh, generation. Uh, and there's also internal pressures of irrigation across provinces. Um, Pakistan, um, hardly unique in this regard, but it, they are using uh, very divisive water allocation rules. They're favoring irrigation over power generation, a reflection of the political system. They're favoring Punjab over Sin. Sin is much more uh, arid and has greater claim in that sense, um, but they do not have the similar political standing. Uh, and the allocation patterns are based upon unrealistically high estimates of availability. And there, therefore, this process is increasing uh, a division of interest between an emerging small and medium enterprises depending upon power generation and Really, the whole hope of the Pakistan economy depends upon the success of these people. Um, traditional agriculture based upon irrigation and growing urban areas depending upon water services. All these internal pressures are building uh, in the Pakistani system. Um, this situation is being uh, very meaningfully intensified by major climate effects, the biggest of which um, is a complicated scenario involving uh, accretion at high altitudes of the Karakoram glaciers, the net effect of, and then receding at low altitudes. And the net effect of that is to reduce the Indus River water flows by 30% against its historic base. Um, uh, in addition to that, they're, they're encountering increasing uh, variability, uh, drought in some areas and increasing precipitation in other. We just heard about the, the floods uh, that they encountered. Um, uh, this is one of the climate effects, uh, increasing the extremes. Uh, and they're encountering increasing ambient temperatures affecting agricultural product cycles. Um, uh, so Pakistan is already under very severe climate pressure and it is putting a sort of extreme burdens or strong burdens uh, on the process in that society. The point of all this is that they're having daily, almost daily, certainly weekly riots associated with this throughout Pakistan. Um, village riots over power outages, some, uh, large parts of Pakistan get power outages averaging 14 to 18 hours a day. Um, uh, and that is uh, severely hurting uh, sort of a lot of their uh, small industries. Uh, and people are in the street writing about that, i.e. what we're seeing already, although we're not really picking it up here, is sign of increasingly violent stress in a critical society. And it is being uh, burdened by climate change. That's not the only story, but it's probably the most dramatic story worldwide going on. Um, all right. What are the global security implications then of this situation? Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's prudent to say that we must anticipate in that some societies, um, the um, adaptation failures will be severe enough to induce international reaction of unprecedented magnitude, i.e. we're looking at crises that are larger than anything um, that we've encountered as yet. 
Um, in addition, and here I really am departing from the National Academy of Study, they didn't have anything to do with that, but in this situation, uh, let me, I'll make some comments to the effect. We have to prepare to manage geoengineering contingencies, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, uh, but also, we must eventually anticipate a compelling global mitigation effort. We are not yet trying, seriously trying, to transform energy generation to the extent that would be required to contain the global warming impulse. But I would say within a couple of decades, we're going to be trying very, very hard because the uh, cumulative impact of these climate effects. So um, what I want to do is talk to about immediate practical steps. And uh, we've had some allusion to uh, the, if you will, uh, difficulty, put it that way, gently, of our political system in taking any initiative whatsoever on any subject. Um, um, so these practical steps are not immediately directed at the government. It's directed at you, at the society. Um, what we as a whole, as a society, are going to have to begin doing. Um, and, and I can tell you, don't count on your political leaders to initiate this process. Uh, it's going to require engagement from a lot more people. First step um, in this situation is that we need to develop a monitoring system worthy of the problem. Um, we are not monitoring the details uh, of climate change and social change associated with that in anything like the precision that would be required to understand them. Um, um, I can elaborate if you want, but that involves bringing together the various assets we have um, uh, to, to create an integrated system of monitoring climate variables and related social variables so that we can watch uh, on a high resolution basis as these situations develop. Um, uh, at the moment, if we were watching, we would all be very, very alarmed about Pakistan. Um, uh, but we're not watching in sufficient detail to know that we ought to be concerned. Um, we should realize that this is, although the United States would have to play a major role, this is going to have to be an international effort, and therefore a lot of diplomacy involved in assuring global collaboration. Um, uh, and what we ought to do, in addition to collecting the information, uh, we ought to begin to understand how to do stress tests for burdened countries. Uh, if there are banks um, too big to fail and we've figured out that we need to figure out how to monitor whether they're failing or not, there are countries too important to fail and we need to monitor uh, their stress under this situation. We're not yet doing it. Um, uh, in addition, um, <coughs> Uh, I think it's predictable and urgent that we establish protocols for global reading of that SRM, the solar radi radiation management, in other words, the geoengineering techniques that might be applied to contain um, global warming, uh, uh, if you will, artificially. Um, I don't know why nature is so configured this way, but as it turns out, sulfate particles in the stratosphere um, um, offset um, the CO2 effect, molecule effect, at a rate of something like 200 or 300,000 to one. Um, um, and therefore, uh, as volcanoes have demonstrated, we can, by polluting the stratosphere, if you will, reduce average surface temperatures by as much as a half a degree in a single year. Um, several countries, are, that would take about $10 billion a year to do. Uh, Several countries are capable of conducting that operation in their own airspace, i.e. not having to go out into any international environment. Um, and some of these might be subjected to severe enough pressures to actually be tempted to do so. Um, but it should be obvious in advance that manipulation of the global atmosphere almost certainly be considered a supreme global interest. And the bottom line of this, before it starts to happen, we need rules regulating um, uh, any geoengineering technique, um, and we don't yet have those rules. Um, um, let me then go on to say that um, uh, when it comes to the point, and it will come to this point, that we start taking mitigation seriously, i.e., how do we really contain the thermal impulse associated with human activity, um, uh, and you work your way through all the figures, there's an inescapable conclusion. We're not going to be able to do it 
uh, without dramatic expansion of nuclear power generation. We cannot do it. Nor can we expand nuclear power generation to the degree required, safely at any rate, based upon current reactor designs or current fuel cycle management practices. Um, um, uh, and therefore, if we really are going to rely on that technology as we would have to if we want to solve the problem, we're going to have to change the technical basis for doing it and the institutional basis for it as well. Um, 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 and so uh, uh, a practical thing that should be immediately done is to develop um, prototype reactors uh, that are inherently safe and have seal field features so they do not encounter proliferation problems. Um, is that 10 minutes? Is that? Okay. I'll easily finish within that. Um, uh, we also should realize uh, that in a world forced, basically, uh, to depend upon nuclear power generation, we are going to have to keep track of nuclear explosive isotopes much more carefully than we're currently doing. Um, that is, again, technically feasible, but we're not doing it. Um, and therefore, we need to develop an accounting and physical security system that keeps control of these things to a much higher standard than we're currently doing. Again, technically feasible, but we're not uh, yet doing it. Um, and so we need to talk about that. Um, and then finally, um, uh, I would say that as this situation evolves and we begin to encounter uh, predictable crises of adaptation and a predictable concern for serious mitigation, um, we are going to have to transform the underlying security relationships among the major players, uh, the, uh, the US, the EU, Russia, China, and India at a minimum. Um, Russia and China have 40% of the world population among them and a lot of the economic growth yet to go. Global warming will either be won or lost uh, in Russia or China. Um, and that means we need to engage in those societies um, to put them on a, on a path of transformation um, and as kind of the leading instances that will bring the rest of the world along as well. We do not have the financing, uh, the technical exchange provisions, or the underlying relationships to support that, um, and we're going to have to do it. Um, that requires um, a, a very substantial change in prevailing attitudes. Um, uh, most of what I said here um, uh, involve changes that go way beyond um, what Washington is going to be inclined to be talking about um, uh, anytime soon. And therefore, the whole subject depends upon some kind of social initiative uh, emerging uh, beyond the normal politics. Um, and how, do I, how does that happen? I don't know. It's part of why I'm talking here. Let's try to figure it out. It's got to happen, uh, or we're all in very deep trouble. Um, I, and now I'm actually quite interested in what you have to say about this, because sort of I've been in closed doors for a year listening to the climate scientists um, and the social scientists trying to figure out what, what they're saying means. I, I'm sort of very interested in what normal political attitudes are, because believe me, all of you are going to have to play in this if it's going to work. So can everyone still hear me if I'm speaking from here? Very good. Uh, I have a number of questions here, which I'm going to sort out. And, um, but let me start with, with one that um, comes from me, too, maybe. Uh, that relate to um, events happening in Washington right now. Tomorrow uh, there will be, well, I should say yesterday because of the snowstorm, there was an event that was canceled, <laughs> which was occurring at the House Science and Technology Committee. There was to be a hearing that would feature uh, two uh, individuals who are essentially skeptics or deniers of climate change. Um, Ironically enough, that event was snowed out and did not take place. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, former Secretary of State George Shultz, known to many of us here in the Bay Area, um, is going to Washington, I believe, today and is scheduled to appear on Capitol Hill tomorrow to give a briefing, but is not invited to testify. 
because I presume he's not seen with favor by the uh, Republicans there. You've spent most of your career in Washington, D.C. Um, it's all very well to say Washington can't solve this right now, but Washington is the big player, has been the big player in climate politics for 20 years now. Is there no reason for hope in this regard? The president said recently in his State of the Union and inauguration speeches that climate change matters to him. He will act if Congress will not. What's your view of all that? Uh, he, I, I hope that he will try to act, um, and he can, without Congress, do some useful things. Um, but we are very, very far from from uh, putting ourselves on a path that leads to serious mitigation. Um, and the initiative for that just isn't going to come from Washington in the first instance, okay, until there is a state change, if you will, in, in the public consciousness. Uh, like it or not, we have a democracy, all sorts, of, yeah, and which, which empowers, if you will, um, minority opinion, lest they be uh, tyrannized, if you will, by the majority. We set up our political system to do that, to protect against, and, and it hangs us up when we have um, uh, intense minority opinion that cuts across what everyone would like to do. Um, um, so what I would say, yes, I'm sure there will be, there is a lot of initiative being undertaken in Washington. People are trying to stu study the subject. Um, but it is not remotely adequate, and it will not be remotely adequate until there is a state change in the political system on this. And that is going to come from outside of Washington. Um, and that's why people who live there kind of say, Washington isn't the answer. Of course, it has got to be part of the answer, but Washington will not move until this society moves uh, on this subject. Uh, the deniers, some of them are, are, are deeply sincere. They seem to really believe. Um, uh, others, I think, are pretty cynical. Um, um, uh, and, but they are, they are a, a, a major stumbling block at the moment. In part, they're getting in the way of doing the monitoring that I just suggest. They're not eager to have the data that will prove that they're wrong, and so therefore they, they attempt to, to stop it. Um, um, so part of what I've said, that's why I began with that, everybody ought to insist that we start monitoring this situation uh, much more uh, actively than we currently, because we certainly can do it. It's just a matter of will to do it. Uh, at a minimum, to say, we not let's settle this debate. We really have to know, okay? Let's not be philosophical about this. Let's measure um, and insist on at least that much. And I think there is clearly a solid majority in the country in that piece. But at the moment, you know, the satellites that ought to be watching uh, uh, are not. Um, and in fact, if you want to get a sense of the magnitude of the problem, um, a lot of our satellite Im imagery is devoted to sort of uh, traditional security, trying to track terrorists, if you want, on the ground, uh, uh, as if they were submarines or tanks. That, um, uh, and the satellite design to, to do environmental monitoring is quite different, and satellites are very expensive. Um, so we have a big change in priorities that we're going to have to go through before we can, can really um, uh, do the kind of measurements that will enable the scientists to answer these questions. And again, that's going to have to come from society. It's not going to initiate it in Washington. And of course, recently, some of the, sign, some of the satellites, rather, uh, have been threatened with being shut down because yes. of the budget cuts being but the proposed. The budget cuts, right. Yeah. And of course you can figure out the people who are interested in budget cuts are particularly interested in cutting this particular budget that will give details that they don't want to find out. Imagine that. Um, your comments about nuclear energy have provoked a lot of questions sure here, <laughs> almost as many as Pakistan. Uh, let me start, since there's a number of them, by mentioning the example of Germany. Uh, there's a new book out now called Coming Clean, I think, yeah. uh, that describes the so-called Energiewende in Germany where they have made a decision to essentially switch their economy off of carbon fuels and they expect to be there by 2030. And they're doing that uh, across the political spectrum because the German political and economic classes have decided, as you alluded, that green energy is really the 
one of yeah. the big strategic sectors in the 21st century. Yeah. Given the fact that the world's leading export economy, Germany, is making that kind of a decision, leaving <laughs> nuclear behind and going for other uh, alternative energy, non-carbon sources, why do you believe that the U.S. has to go uh, nuclear? I, I, I'm saying that the world has to go nuclear. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I didn't sort of rig this to lead you through the numbers that make this incontrovertible, but um, just in brief, um, uh, the um, <clears throat> In order to transform the energy system, global energy system, to the point at which we would hold at something like 450 or 500 parts per million by mid-century, which you have to do um, uh, in order to um, uh, fend off, if you will, the, the worst of these events, we would have to generate something like probably 900 exajoules of energy a year on a different basis than we're currently doing. And you go look at the technologies that can conceivably do that. There's, there's wind, there's solar, there's biomass, there's nuclear fission, and there's what's called carbon sequestration. Um, everybody's favorite uh, is carbon sequestration because there's a lot of coal, and particularly the United States and China have a lot of coal. Um, but in the end of the day, um, it's not going to be possible to take carbon out of the ground burn it for fuel, and put it back in the ground at gigaton scale, as fixed as it was before. Um, and if it leaks or if it surges, that would be a disaster. You would drive the whole economy in exactly the wrong direction. Say I. Okay, this is hotly disputed, to put it mildly. Um, but I think my own sense is that that's when we fully understand the details, we're going to realize we really cannot do that. And that comes off the table. Um, and you take that off the table in particular, and there's just no way you can get to these numbers without a dramatic global expansion of nuclear power generation. Um, the Germans are very, I mean, I, I hope that they in fact can do it, but, but it's very, they're going to almost certainly have to back off their, their commitment not to use nuclear. Um, uh, in fact, what they're doing is they're, new, they're importing nuclear power from France. Um, uh, saying, well, it's not us, but it, <laughs> since the French do it. Um, and I, you know, I, I once, sort of proving how foolish I am or whatever, I, I went to a Green Party conference in Berlin a couple of years ago, and they wanted me to talk about getting rid of nuclear weapons, which I'm very much in favor of. And I said, yes, let's do that, and it's actually feasible. But the other side of that, um, and related to that is that we're going to need nuclear power. They didn't like that part of the argument at all. Um, um, but at the end of the day, if you work through these numbers, there, it is unavoidable. We are not going to make it without a dramatic expansion of nuclear power, and we cannot do it on the basis of current reactor designs. That would be infeasibly um, uh, risky. Um, and. Uh, I know that's unpopular. Um, most people would like to believe otherwise. Let me just tell you, go look at the numbers, and it's unavoidable um, that either we do it that way or we don't do it. Following up on that, on, in, the, uh, uh, in the study that, that you and the National Academy of Sciences did on this, did you look at the role of agriculture? We always talk about energy in terms of climate change, but some of the uh, most exciting developments that I see as a reporter in this field talk about using forests and plants and basically photosynthesis to extract large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, having essentially the same effect that you're advocating yeah, for geoengineering. Yeah, and that's, that's the, what I refer to as the biomass mm -hmm. option. Yes, and there's a lot of very promising um, developments um, um, uh, along those lines, but again, go look at the hard numbers, how much you have to produce and how you can produce it. Uh, we don't have enough land area. Um, uh, uh, to produce the bi biomass at the volume required to, if you will, take nuclear off the table. I assume that there will be a major contribution. It's just not going to be able to carry the enough bio, of, the the bi yes. biomass. Yeah. And, and it, uh, let me just admit that and there's a lot of uncertainty here. Here I will admit that um, uh, there is an argument 
that, that as we uh, learn much more about um, uh, biotechnology and ability to do genetic manipulation, we may do better than I'm saying in terms of uh, uh, learning how to uh, use basically biological waste to good effect. And so I may be underplaying, if you will, the um, uh, potential contribution of biomass, but it, it requires heroic assumptions to assume that it could sort of be leveled up to the magnitude and at the time required to get us off of the requirement for, for nuclear power generation. Uh, and unlikely. When you, uh, let me just say also about that. When you're talking about adaptation problems, the interaction between water dynamics and agriculture becomes extremely important. Um, in Pakistan, in Egypt, et cetera, we're very worried about food price spikes um, playing into social unrest. That's a real, real concern in Egypt at the moment. A lot of uh, questions here also about the notion of geoengineering, in particular this uh, <clears throat> use of um, aerosols and so forth. Uh, what are the risks and the downsides associated with that idea of putting aerosols up in the atmosphere? Uh, and can the kind of international regime of inspection and, and monitoring that you advocated, can that really be done on a nation by nation basis? Uh, the, the risks are huge. I think this is a horrible idea. You can tell that I, I think it's dangerous uh, um, because uh, you put these particles in the stratosphere, they, there's globally dispersed and you get a lot of different local effects, exacerbating the uh, uh, particularly sort of uh, the precipitation patterns in, in tropical areas and other places. But, but it, doesn't under, it doesn't have any effect on the under, underlying global sort of warming impulse associated with uh, carbon dioxide. Doesn't, it just offsets the effect, it doesn't remove that effect. So I go around saying, you know, it's, it, without a corresponding amount of mitigation, it's the equivalent of heroin addiction, and at least is irresponsible. Um, that, and yet, did you not say that we have to consider that path? I am saying the scientists are concluding now we have to consider it because it might be needed for emergency reasons, i.e., we don't have mitigation going on. If we get some effect, it looks really horrendous, and we have to... Um, control it for a period of time, and what I say back to them, fine, okay. A, there has to be global vetting because you're missing, messing with, and we don't have them. And it cannot be done as a substitute for mitigation. It has to be done with a correspondingly, uh, uh, a, a mitigation program that will have a corresponding effect, or it's, or it's wildly responsible. The, the big risk is acidification of the oceans. Um, if you let global warming proceed and you put sulfur particles in the atmosphere, you're increasing the acidification of the ocean, which is already a problem. You're messing with the food chain, the basics of the food chain. You know, that's apocalyptic stuff. I think geoengineering is extremely dangerous because it can be done and it's very tempting. Uh, and, and relatively we, cheaply. Very cheaply, 10 billion a year. Um, uh, I don't know why nature is so configured, but that's the way it is. A uh. couple of questions here about, you were saying that the, the change has to come from us, from the society. Uh, two, what do you think will cause that social change, and can citizens realistically expect to affect Washington, given how much power corporations <laughs> and big money have? <laughs> you are in San Francisco, after <laughs> all. We ask those kinds of questions here. Well, they're good questions. <laughs> Better questions than I have answers for. The, we got to believe that it's possible, right? Because otherwise, uh, um, uh, and we're dealing with very, very large consequences. Um, uh, we don't know the details yet, but they will emerge uh, with increasing clarity. Uh, and so um, uh, there's an impulse out there to change attitudes. Um, and when attitudes change, Washington changes too. The one thing I would say about the place is that it, it does respond to trends of opinion, um, like it or not. Um, and uh, um, if the, at the moment, polling on this suggests that uh, a pretty consistent 75% of the country agrees that climate change is occurring and that humans are involved. That's the reason, I mean, the anthropogenic. 
but it's not salient. It seems like down the line, that's sort of a century away, not something I immediately have to worry about. Meanwhile, I have a job I have to worry about and a lot of other things. So on polls, it, it, if you ask people what concerns them just without giving them options, it doesn't even show up. Um, uh, Why that, do you think the president said what he said then in the State of the Union? Bec because he's picking up what the scientists are beginning to say. It's a look at, yeah, we got a problem here. It's a very big, big, big problem. He's, so what could he do to answer that person's question? Or what could the president do? The, well, the president could do a lot to, if he were really willful about it, to uh, put together the monitoring system I just described. Those are budget choices that he, in principle, could affect. Um, uh, I hate to speak for him, right? He's, the, the relative priority of that, as opposed to immigration reform, as opposed to gun control. Um, um, I'm not the president. I don't aspire to be the president. I'm glad I don't have to, to, to deal with these issues, OK? Um, if he gave it sufficient priority, he could do a lot. Whether he is able to, uh, under these political circumstances, is beyond my pay grade, if you will. I, Many of the environmental organizations are saying that uh, the Clean Water, sorry, the Clean Air Act gives the EPA and therefore the president uh, direct authority to uh, limit greenhouse gas emissions. And, and I trust that the new appointment has that in mind. And, and, uh, um, but the, the point, what we're not currently doing is developing um, uh, at the pace required the alternative energy generation technologies that would be required. And again, the big, big deal. There are nuclear reactor designs that are inherently safe. They act like batteries, basically, OK? It costs maybe a billion dollars over 10 years to bring them up to the point where you could actually buy them, produce them. Um, trivial amount of money, um, given the magnitude of the problem. Nobody has that money. Nobody can run. We, we don't have any mechanism for making that investment. Um, and again, as I work through the issues, the, the, the details of the, the numbers, and I'm not alone in this regard, you just reach a conclusion. Until we do that, we're not going to make it. Um, Would putting a carbon price through the market, oh, or yeah. whether it be through the EPA yeah. or cap yeah. and trade, oh, no, would you, that provide enough incentive for private capital? If you can capital? figure out how to impose the right carbon price, the market takes care of the problem. Including um, the investment that would be yeah, needed Including to the investment that required. Uh, that's the magic wand. Figure out how to get the political, this has to be a global market price, right? It's not just the U.S. Figure out how to do that, you've solved the problem. In um, that regard, I thought it was uh, interesting and heartening that uh, China has now imposed a, in effect, a cap and trade system for some of its leading regions. Yeah. Uh, I defer, uh, cap and trade is kind of a, uh, an indirect way of doing the carbon. Uh, uh, if you could literally just tomorrow say, okay, worldwide, here's the carbon price, that's the way it's going to be, that would redirect the entire, and markets would then begin to do these things. So, but until that happens, we've got natural gas and a lot of other things that's going to keep us away from that. In that regard, a question uh, that says, I suggest, I suggest sitting down with the director of the Low Carbon Project at Livermore Labs here in the Bay Area, uh, Mr. S. Julio Friedman, to develop large-scale, cooperative, collaborative, clean, green energy projects that could be shared with China, Russia, et cetera. What's your view of that? Absolutely, we should be doing that. Uh, the, institutionally, we do not have the mechanism for organizing what needs to happen. China and India particularly do not have either the technology or the financing to go through the energy transformation they need to go through. Um, um, so we need institutional mechanisms for doing that, um, and uh, uh, urgently. <laughs> and at the moment, they're, they're not in sight. Uh, a couple of questions here about population which often comes up in these remarks. It's been estimated that the world population will increase to nine billion, dollar, nine billion people, people in 25 years. What's the best scenario uh, that you see for that? And a second related question, isn't overpopulation a major part of the climate change problem, and why is this connection not made? Why can't much more be done about containing population? 
Well, population drives the problem, yes, obviously. Um, uh, Nine billion is kind of a hopeful projection because some of, the, some of it goes over 10. Um, uh, the, there's a natural process of slowing of population increase going on. Uh, birth rates are falling across the world. Um, um, they have to get down to 2.1 children per woman um, to stabilize. Okay, and what we don't know is, are they going to go down to that level, or are they going to below that level? Um, uh, uh, and you know, actually, if the single most important factor that does this is women's education. Okay, you want to control population. That's what you do. You educate women across the world, and that brings down the birth rate. Um, um, gives a little insight into what's at stake in Pakistan. Right? <laughs> this is not just in, in, in Afghanistan. It's not what just are the birth rates now in Pakistan? Is that going up or down? It's coming down, and I can't cite you the exact figure, but it's coming down from something like over six to over three or something roughly in that. Um, th there are people who know this exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, but it's moving in the right direction. It's moving in the right direction, but we don't know where it will stop. It's got to keep moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but yes, I mean, the, the problem of energy transformation is, is enormously intensified by having to deal with an increasing population. You can have to two or three factor of two or three increase in overall production while we're transforming the basis of it in order to cope with the population. So, but there's... Uh, short of something truly catastrophic, uh, it, it takes as long to control the population as it does to transform the energy sector. Uh, you can tell we have some very intelligent students in the audience here. We're getting some um, theoretical questions. Here's one about game theory. And uh, you're a professor, so I assume you'll be able to hit this one out of the park. <laughs> <clears throat> game theory predicts that no international consensus is achievable on the climate problem. Do you take a more constructivist stance on what international communities care about? Yes. And in answering that, could you please inform the rest of us who have uh, still not completed our PhDs what exactly constructivist means? <laughs> the, uh, uh, yes is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Tricky. Uh, Game theory, I mean, it depends on how you apply game theory as to whether you reach that conclusion or not, right? And what game theory shows is that the interaction of rational calculators, um, and uh, 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 let me just say uh, that I was originally trained as a cognitive psychologist. Um, I still consider that to be my, my sort of disciplinary base, so to speak, although they would no longer recognize me. Um, um, but if you're trained that way and you begin to listen to the way economics speaks, the game theorist speaks, you say, you've got to be joking, right? Um, people don't make decisions that way. They can't make decisions that way. Uh, the brain is not configured for very powerful reasons. Um, so what I would say, yeah, okay, that's, game theory does not show the way decisions are actually made. We do know that. Um, uh, and, and I think it is plausible to believe that sort of evolutionary process, which is more like how we actually think, um, can lead us out of this mess. Um, and uh, uh, that there will be constructive response to the pressures uh, as they accumulate. Um, uh, that the whole process of evolution works this way. We're in the, in the midst of that process. This is, this is a change in the environment requiring an adaptation. Um, either societies do or they don't survive. Um, believe, if you will, in the <coughs> impulse for survival. That's working for us here. Um, On the impulse for survival, of course, there's been a lot of media attention in recent months about the Keystone XL pipeline. We've seen civil disobedience at the White House. We just saw 40,000 people gather uh, on President's Day weekend to urge President Obama to block that pipeline. Question here is, do you think that that pipeline uh, is more economically beneficial than it is environmentally harmful? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, no is my answer, but I haven't sort of soaked in the details of that. Let me, I, I, I don't claim to have a, 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 an extremely well-informed No, if it were up to me, I wouldn't let it happen. But, but I admit that, that it probably is a close call, actually. Uh, and uh, a second related question, fracking. What is your view about fracking of natural gas? I worry about whether we know the full consequences of it, obviously. Um, um, uh, uh, but the people I know who have looked at it, who are inclined to worry about it, say actually it can be done fairly safely. Whether it is being done safely or not is another question, but it can be done safely. Um, but we, we, you know, we have to look at the consequences of, of that process down the line. And, and uh, uh, Realistically, burden of proof falls on anybody who wants to demonstrate it's unacceptably dangerous because it's very, very effective, or at least so far. Um, uh, I would worry about our, our, because of the uh, amount of money that can be get uh, using it, that, that we pick up the consequences down the line and too late. Uh, and so it, it, it does concern me. The negative consequences. The negative consequences. Um, uh, however, I will say that people who who are are very concerned about that sort of thing have taken a look at it and said it's it's you know it's it, it, you can do it responsibly. There was I just a vote yesterday in this regard, kind of big news that the uh, uh, New York State Assembly voted to continue for two more years that state's moratorium on fracking. Of course, this is going to be a big issue for Governor Cuomo, uh, right. who is widely uh, reputed to want to run for president in 2016. Yeah. On this and many other topics, the question is who should carry the burden of proof because whoever carries it loses, basically. Um, and at the moment... Um, whoever carries the burden of proof mm-hmm. loses. Is that a sort of rule of thumb in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> it's a pretty good rule of thumb, right, which is why people fight over this. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, who should have the burden of proof? They fight hard over it. Recognize that if you really impose it on... Uh, on the other side, uh, you're, you're likely to, to win. Uh, I would, you can see, certainly like to impose the burden of proof on carbon sequestration. I would apply that to fracking as well. Um, um, I, whether you can, I, I'm afraid that that's not the way it works. At the moment, you have to demonstrate that fracking is unacceptably dangerous to get a hearing. Uh, and I would worry about that fact. Mm-hmm. Here's an interesting question. Who has been briefed on your National Academy of Sciences study? And is the core political disagreement in Washington, I gather, over the science of climate change or over the willingness to take on the near-term costs of addressing climate change? So who's been briefed? And then what's the argument about? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's trying not, a not tough to get question. myself in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me tell you the, the story of how the report, the report was to be briefed to quote the sponsor. And as far as the National Academy of Sciences is concerned, the sponsor is the intelligence community as a whole. Um, um, it turns out that one of its more prominent members was the real sponsor and didn't want that to be known. Um, Sorry, uh, one of whose more prominent members? I'm not supposed to say, but you can figure out who it is. <laughs> one of um, the more prominent members of the community? Of the intelligence community. I see. Um, but it's the academy was officially and acting on behalf of the intelligence community as a whole. Um, uh, the Briefing to the sponsor, the real sponsor, um, um, was to occur on the day that Sandy hit and the government was closed. Um, uh, And so um, two days later, I got an email from somebody from the Huffington Post saying, I I thought you guys were coming out with this report yesterday. Um, What happened to it? And they were looking for some kind of political shenanigans. And I said, well, Sandy happened to it. You know, the, the government was closed. We have to brief the sponsor. I use that phrase, sponsor, um, uh, before we can 
before we can uh, uh, publish the report. Um, uh, this person who I've never met, never talked to, had just two sentence email exchange with, then wrote an article naming the sponsor and making it seem as if I had named the sponsor. Um, that became the issue. <laughs> um, all hell broke loose. Um, why the sponsor cared about not being identified or thought that could not, it's a mystery to me. But that became the issue, okay? And I think it's fair to say that um, said sponsor was finally briefed on the report and nobody else. Um, uh, now, was that an accident, probably, or did somebody deliberately try to sabotage the, the publication of the report? It's hard to know. Um, but that's what happens. People who don't like what you're saying create some diversionary issue, um, throw that up, the press gets distracted, and the whole thing goes away. Odd that would come from the Huffington Post, though, which is associated with people I, who I want to fight climate change. Yeah. But since it's been reported, can't you share with us who the sponsor is? <laughs> <laughs> Honor bound, I've, I've been really beat up on this. No, I cannot publicly say who it is, even though you can easily figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps more to the point, have the intelligence committees in the Senate and the House and their uh, colleagues in the executive branch in the White House been briefed? The, and the, if not, why not? Um, uh, simple answer is they haven't been sufficiently interested. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have a story. Uh, do we have time for a couple more? Okay. Um, here's a big one. Is perpetual economic growth even possible given climate change and natural resource constraints on this planet? Or must the relationship between economic growth and climate change be changed? Well, ultimately, we live in an environment, a physical environment, that does have limits. Um, second law of thermodynamics applies. Um, and I have a colleague who's now retired at the University of Maryland who harped on that. He said, um, we cannot sort of do, we cannot have indefinite growth. We cannot have resource flows um, um, that grow uh, in unlimited ways. Um, and that's true physically, but I don't think we are close to the literal physical limits on research, research flow. Yes, I think we can, have, we can definitely have growth. We can generate energy in a way that does not uh, endanger the environment. We can do it. We do know how to do it. The question is not what to do, it's wanting to do it. Um, actually, there are huge amounts of money to be made um, doing it. I mean, and there's a lot of sort of money sloshing around, in, obviously, in the world banking system, not knowing where to go, not knowing what to do. So they're playing casino games with it. Um, this is a very productive way to put money is into a, a, a global energy transformation. Um, so if we could do the magic market price, it would happen. Um, there's plenty of technology, plenty of money uh, out there to make it happen. It's just the Market incentives at the moment and the organizational structure won't make it happen. So for the lifetime of our, the grandchildren of everybody in this, in this room, right? even the younger members of my uh, there I don't think there's any physical limit to growth. Eventually there, there is, okay? But, but population is going to top off at some point. Um, um, so uh, we are not facing that kind of literal physical constraint um, that we cannot maneuver our way around. We can transform energy generation in a way that will allow productive economic growth to proceed. Um, uh, and, you know, there's more of an argument about the flow of, of, of uh, various resources, but, you know, we can do recycling. Uh, if we really get serious about it, we can do recycling. Um, so, no, I don't think we're up against physical limits. We're up against attitudinal limits, institutional limits. It's all in our heads. Okay, let's finish with this question. Jane Wales, in her introductory remarks, talked about how we're a little different here in California, including in our business community. And down in Silicon Valley, there are quite a few 
uh, big deal entrepreneurs who are very keen on uh, green energy, fighting climate change, uh, feel obviously a great kinship with the strate strategic decision that the Germans are pursuing. They see this clearly as the one of the big uh, sectors of the world economy to dominate in the 21st century, so much so that um, when the Koch brothers came in and, and tried to overthrow the, the global warming law here in California a couple of years ago, most of the money to defeat that came not from Hollywood liberals, but from Silicon Valley. Right. Right. With that in mind, uh, you who have spent so much of your career in Washington, what is the role that business leaders across the country can do to push for things like a uh, real carbon price, to push for the kinds of, of green energy investments that you're advocating here today? Well, if, if, if you know, the energy corporations really wanted this to happen, they could make it happen, but they don't want it to happen because, um, because um, the consequence of the transformation I discussed is that you allocate away from, from fossil fuels much more rapidly than they, than they were. So people with big equity in the whole infrastructure of producing um, uh, fossil fuels for energy are, uh, are going to be very difficult to convince them, if you will, to go into a different business and abandon their investment in that. And I can understand that, right? Um, uh, uh, the, uh, it's the society as a whole, because they, they, you know, powerful as they are, they, they do not sort of dictate, if you will, the structure <coughs> of the market. Um, they live within it, they make large sums of money within it, but they don't really dictate the structure of the market. If we figured out globally how to set a the right carbon price and say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, corporate entities worldwide, this is the price you're going to have to pay and you cannot evade it. Um, we would have a radically different situation. The entrepreneurs would be all over it and we would be moving in this direction a lot more rapidly than we're currently moving. Um, uh, it's the structure of the market that the entrepreneurs live in and don't themselves really control uh, that's, that's the problem. <coughs> And with that, I invite all of you to please thank me for a fascinating discussion with John Steinbrenner here today. An, an excellent opening to the World Affairs Council of Northern California's uh, conference here. I want to thank all of you here in the audience as well. Very good questions. And we're now going to have a 15-minute break before our issues and focus sessions. They will be on China's economy left-leaning Latin America, and adapting to climate change. You have three choices. All of those will be located on the fourth floor of the hotel. They will begin at 3.30 p.m. I'm Mark Kurtzgaard. Thank you for being here. <laughs>